Thank you, uh, Lalit, and it's a pleasure being here talking about uh, various things of thalmic. I think uh, my talk's really about intraocular pressure and repeated intravitreal anti-VEGF injections. Now, anti-VEGF injections are by nature, you know, things that have to be repeated in most cases, and intravitreal injections have actually revolutionized the management of many uh, common macular conditions. Uh, it's now the standard of care. But what we don't know is what happens to the eye and to the body with repeated intravitreal injections. And above all, we don't know what it does with the intraocular pressure. The, uh, we, not, we don't normally check the intraocular pressure after injections. And we also know that we're dealing with an older population, patients with AMD, uh, who are generally prone to uh, pressure problems. We're also dealing with patients with diabetes and venous occlusions where pressures do have a role to play. And while we check the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness and fields and all that in patients with ocular hypertension and glaucoma, the concomitant macular disease makes it a little bit more difficult to assess uh, many of the parameters. So let's talk about the immediate intraocular pressure alterations. Each time you put something into the eye, whether it's 0.05 mil or 0.1 mil, it causes a change in intraocular pressure, and the pressure can rise to as high as uh, even 80 or 90 millimeters of mercury, and after a, a little while, it does come down. Now, so what? But we know now that repeated intraocular injections, or intravitreal injections, also cause structural changes uh, not only uh, to the retinal nerve fiber layer, but also to the Brooks membrane opening, which is really the opening through which the optic nerve joins the eye. And this has been demonstrated very clearly on OCT that even after one injection and even at the end of one year, these changes are actually permanent. So, you know, how does the pressure rise? I mean, the first thing you say, you're, you're putting something inside, it's a volume effect. But I think it's a little more than that because the anti-VEGF injections do alter the VEGF levels in the trabecular meshwork, and we know that VEGF is responsible and necessary for health of the eye and the body. Silicone micro droplets, high, uh, and, and other additives in the syringe, you know, your syringe is quite smooth to press, and uh, they come into the eye, and that can cause uh, a problem too. Many of the uh, drugs that we are injecting are very high molecular weight proteins which can uh, clog the uh, trabecular meshwork, it can cause an inflammatory response, can cause structural changes, and of course sometimes we see reflux of the, of the drug which can also play a role not in increasing but in decreasing the intraocular pressure. And lastly, I think eyes with glaucoma and ocular hypertension have uh, already a compromised facility about flow and very often uh, you know, problems with the ocular perfusion. Talking about reflux, uh, when, you, when you actually see the reflux after you're given an intraocular injection, first thing you do is take a cotton bud or something and, and press it because you don't want the drug to come out and you don't want bugs to get in. Otherwise, you'd have to deal with uh, many of the issues that uh, we just heard from, from, from Andrew. Uh, whenever there is reflux, of course, the pressure rise or the pressure spike is less. But uh, the pressure rise can still be significant as in this uh, particular patient who, uh, kept, yeah, after, keep, after each injection, he kept getting a stage where there was no perception of light and, and we would check the pressure straight away and his pressures were still, as you would consider, quite normal. So uh, initially we started using a little Honan balloon to reduce the pressure before an injection, but perhaps just the use of a standard glaucoma drop, uh, maybe not pilocarpine but anything else, uh, given two hours before the injection would reduce the intraocular pressure. Some people like to use Dimox, but a drop is, a drop is good enough. In fact, by giving an a, 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 a anti-glaucoma medication or some, an ocular hypo, hypotensive drop, you can see in this graph that the pressure rise is blunted. Uh, while this may not be important for most of the patients that we deal with, but certainly preventing these pressure spikes can become important in people with glaucoma, with ocular hypertension, with, uh, you know, uh, a dodgy or, a, or an outflow uh, of a, or a optic nerve head perfusion issue. That's all in the short term, but what about the long term? Many of the pivotal studies for macular degeneration have actually looked and found that the pressure does go up a little bit. 
uh, but many of them do not, did not address the issue of long-term patients with glaucoma. In fact, if you had elevated intraocular pressure, many of these patients were excluded from the study. But what the current literature uh, talks about is that the overall pool prevalence of, uh, of sustained elevation of intraocular pressure is as high as, high as 8.3 percent with the glaucoma uh, being a significant risk factor. The American Academy review uh, found that there was insufficient evidence to uh, determine the impact of intravitreal injections on intraocular pressure. And if you look at all the studies, what you see is that they use different criteria, they use different machines, and in fact, they don't as uh, assess the impact of glaucoma as a risk factor in most of these studies. So you can see that we don't really have too much information on long-term effect of intravitreal injections. So we decided to have a look at our own patients in, in, in Hobart in Tasmania, and we, uh, we looked at uh, almost 21,000 injections over an 11-year period. Uh, and we sort of looked at what the criteria should be, so any pressure above 22 millimeters of mercury or a rise in pressure of 6 millimeters of mercury on three occasions or any single uh, elevation to above 26 millimeters of mercury was considered as SEIOP or significant elevation of intraocular pressure. So that's the primary outcome that we've been looking at, but I'll, I'll address some of the other issues that come up also. Looking at the demographics, as expected, most of the patients, or the majority of patients, were in the AMD category, followed by diabetes and retinal vein occlusions. We had uh, 64 eyes with uh, glaucoma, and uh, what we found was, uh, just get this out of the way, yeah, we found was that with, compared to other studies, the diabetics were, pressure rise was about the same, but in our study, we found that macular degeneration, the pressure rise was not as much as uh, the patients with diabetes. And uh, in fact, in many of the, you know, when we, look, we looked at uh, these cohorts, we found that the confidence intervals were fairly large and with an overlap with normal eyes. Looking at the drug that was injected, you sort of say, well, which drug is the culprit? Well, we found that there was no difference, although the fight retinal blindness registry from Sydney uh, they found that ranibizumab or Lucentis had a higher chance of intraocular pressure rise as compared, as compared to ILEA or aflibercept. The factors of significance, pre-existing glaucoma, ocular hypertension, and fakia. So pseudophakia is a protective factor uh, in, this, in this situation. Now here's an example of uh, a 72-year-old male with AMD on treatment given ranibizumab over all these years. Uh, he held his glaucoma indices very well, as you can see here. This is ocular hypertensive. Somebody with glaucoma on uh, treatment with uh, Travaprost and been uh, given Avastin or Bevacizumab with pre-existing defects, and you find that they, are, they hold on quite well, although there's a little bit of deterioration. In a third patient, who is a one-eyed patient, much older, and uh, has got uh, diabetic macular, oh, macular edema secondary to a retinal vein occlusion. Uh, for many years, the macular thickness and vision stays constant, but with time, the pressure, as you see on the green uh, points in his left eye, which is his only eye, the pressure has been rising slowly, 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 slowly. And now he's on maximal medical therapy, and given that he's only one-eyed, he's very scared of getting anything done. Uh, in fact, I had a job to convince him even to have an SLT done. These are his glaucoma parameters, and these are his visual fields in an only eye. So when I get back to Hobart, I've got uh, to figure out something for him. But you can see the dilemma that both the patient and me as treating him have. So if you look at where this whole thing lands up in the big, uh, you know, as compared to other studies, uh, you see this this blue part, which is where we are, and I think uh, we see that pressure rise is a problem. We also see that uh, we've got 27 patients with, uh, you know, with glaucoma, and I think that this perhaps is, uh, is an important thing in trying to figure out what happens. 
answers to some other questions, not from our study, but otherwise is how long does it take for the pressure rise to occur? One year, two years, and it's generally about a year and a half. Uh, looking at the diabetes, you find there always seems to be a higher incidence in diabetic patients, and it's quite often correlated with the HbA1c. The facility of outflow is another factor which is already compromised in patients with uh, ocular hypertension and, and, glau and glaucoma. And in fact, the facility of outflow is always reduced in patients who are getting frequent injections uh, and also at shorter intervals. So if the injections are less than eight weekly, you find that the facility of outflow gets affected uh, as you see in this, this particular graph. So not only the number of ejections, but also what the pressures are like. You see on the right side, we see the facility of outflow is down. Now, no talk can be complete without talking about genetics, but I think in this situation, while we have identified a gene, perhaps there is uh, there's no reason to start worrying about genetics in the start. Lastly, the uh, issue of the syringe. Now, there was a cluster of uh, syringe-related problems in Canada, uh, where the pressure went up and they found that there were silicone micro droplets coming in, and also once they started using silicone-free syringes and also filtered uh, anti-VEGF agents that these pressure problems came down. The new uh, ILEA formulation is in a pre-filled syringe, the barrel of which is much broader than the Lucentis one, and we are quite used to giving a good bit of pressure on it, but I think we initially observed a lot of pressure spikes with ILEA pre-filled syringes, and that was important to try and uh, make sure that the plunger and the line that's drawn on the syringe are properly aligned, and at the end of it, the uh, injection is done without too much pressure, so gentle injection, and you find that you don't get pressure rise. So finally, I think we had a fairly uh, obvious and positive message to give uh, where 117 uh, patient subjects developed uh, sustained elevation of intraocular pressure and in our study it was not related to the kind of treatment that was given. Uh, the SEIOP was associated with pre-existing disease and lens status where glaucoma patients had a 3.5 fold uh, increased risk of uh, pressure rise and pseudophakia reduced the risk of developing uh, in increased intraocular pressure by almost 40%. So I think if there's one take home message is that you need to think about intraocular pressure in patients whom you're treating with repeated intravitreal injections. You know that uh, structural changes occur. You know that this can affect the retinal nerve fiber layer and the perfusion of the optic nerve. But I think if you want to, com to treat an eye, not just the macula, you need to put this into perspective. So the challenge of course remains in identifying those patients and monitoring them more closely. Thank you. That's a view a few days ago at my place where we just had snow, so I'm really enjoying the weather here. Thank you. Thank you, Nitin, for this. Uh, uh, actually, we trivialize this procedure so much uh, that we hardly bother for this in IOP changes. Honestly speaking, uh, except in patients of glaucoma or patients where optic nerve is compromised, maybe in diabetics or Rest of the patients, uh, uh, most of us don't bother about uh, this IOP rises. We used, once we started uh, a decade or more than a decade back, we used to see, uh, you know, before the patient goes home, uh, we, after giving injection, you know, he, he does get the pulsations and optic nerve status seen, and uh, we do uh, NCT and then send him home. And we found that uh, by and large these pressures come down uh, over the next uh, three, four hours. It is not a sustained rise. So as of now, at least in our practice, uh, my practice, we have stopped, uh, you know, miring, we directly send the patient home. So what is your final take? Except we, I saw your last slide that, uh, you know, pseudophagic protective and, and, uh, and patients who have glaucoma, obviously in, in such patients we sometimes do paracentesis also because we don't want any insult to the optic nerve. Yeah, it, it's a difficult problem, as I uh, highlighted in one of my one of my patients, where uh, you know you've got a compromised uh, circulation, trabecular meshwork, and uh, and also macular disease. I think for these are the patients where you've got to be very careful to make sure that you reduce the baseline pressure before an injection, and keep the patient 
uh, at least for half an hour or 40 minutes after the injection to make sure that the pressure has come down before they go. It's standard practice, at least where we go, is to at least check that the patient can see your hand and, you know, and then so get them off the table. You, in all these patients, will you give acetazolamide or some pressure-lowering agents? No, 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 no. Not, not for all patients, but no. compromised patients compromised. where there is glaucoma, they, they can get a, 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 you know, a drop of whatever they're using, sometimes a beta blocker or aplacrondine, any, anything, and they all work very well. You see, your patient number three who said he was doing pretty well, and after some time he had a, you know, worsening of the status. Was it a natural, his own glaucoma disease or related to pressure, related to injections? No, I suspect it's a bit of both, but uh, here's a patient with a retinal vein occlusion where, where intraocular pressure has a role to play. Uh, his, gl his glaucoma is obviously converted from ocular hypertension to glaucoma, that's very clear. I don't think the pressures, uh, the injections have caused that. But the problem, the dilemma right now is how to manage him. Because each time you inject something inside, his pressure is going to shoot up, stay down, and he's got such a fragile optic nerve head perfusion. And I'd be very careful in suggesting that each time he has something that we do a paracentesis. So we must try and do whatever we have to do in a non-interventional way. Can I just add one point? Uh, a very interesting point you raised. I have seen my patients who have been on long-term therapy for poly polypoidal in both eyes, the pseudophagic eye did not develop surprise pressure rises. But after repeated injection, the fake eye did. And what we have been mostly following, we have avoided use of prostaglandin agents, but we have put them on agents which increase the outflow along with the beta blocker. Yep. No, thank you.